everyone. Uh, welcome to Next Curve's Rethink webcast, and we're going to be doing a recap of CES 2024, and uh, we're doing it in partnership with Transforma Insights, and I have Jim Morish, uh, co-founder and principal of Transforma Insights, joining me, and uh, hey, Jim, how are you doing? Absolutely. It's good, it's good to be on. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, still, still slightly in recovery phase from CES, but I guess this is the time to do a wrap up video, right? Yeah. Well, you read my mind because I was going to ask you, how are you doing? How are you feeling? Because you're located in London, right? Exactly. <laughs> and you joined me out in Las Vegas. Uh, and, uh, I was there for a better part of the week. I think you and, uh, uh, Brad Canham, uh, who's your VP of research, were there for almost a week, right? No. Almost a week, yes, yes, exactly. So, yeah, a li little further for me. I think I think I spent twelve hours longer on a plane than you have since we last met. But yes. uh, I'm I'm sure you'll catch up before long. Yeah, um, and, and, yeah. And, yeah, and just so that you know, I'm still trying to recover. So, how was it, Leonard? Uh, well, we're going to get into that. So um, for the folks who are listening in, um, we're going to provide you here with a recap, as I said. Uh, but first off, we're going to share some of our key impressions, you know, those big picture impressions of the event. So uh, Jim's going to share his. I'm going to share mine from a Next Curve perspective. And of course, he will from a Transforma Insights perspective. And then um, we'll then go into some of our key takes across this broad uh, research agenda we went into CES 2024 with. And I'll, I'll just rattle off really quickly the things that we had uh, committed to look into. And these aren't the takes and the findings. These are more of this is what we were interested in. So I'll start off with uh, the uh, tech hype uh, I guess, Anum, uh, which is generative AI, but also more broadly AI, non-terrestrial networks, automotive tech, uh, XR and immersive reality tech, consumer slash enterprise IoT, the future of personal computing with the AI PC, smart home, smart living, uh, EV charging infrastructure, sensors and haptics, wearables and smart fitness slash health. And then of course, finally, our favorite topic and category is the unexpected cool stuff. Right, Jim? Absolutely. What did you think of this year's event? This year's event, I thought it, I thought it was busier than last year's event. Uh, there's a little more life to it. So yeah. I think last year there was about a hundred thousand people in town. This year I've heard it's about one hundred thirty-five thousand. So there's a fair yeah. amount more people. But just the vibe, um, it just, it felt like there was a little more, a little more life to all the conversations. Um, and I think things are beginning to get going again post COVID. I think also there's a view that. Um, the potentially interest rates will come down a bit and people start investing a little bit more. So I think just things are loosening up. I think it's just a little more confidence in the air than there was last year. What do you think? Yeah, um, you're right. You're, it's interesting that you bring the interest rate bit up because we started off last year in a malaise. I mean, actually, as a deep funk. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of companies had cut their spending. And, and you know, what a difference 35,000 extra f attendees makes, because I agree with you. Much more vibrant, um, a different attitude. Uh, it was good to see the semiconductor companies back because they were largely absent or at least a couple of the big ones had minimum, uh, minimal presence at the event. And this year um, they had a bit more and that was notable at least from my perspective and um the other thing that was really notable is the the industrial flavor right yes yes so see, yes we graduated we graduated from the john deere tractor to something a lot bigger apparently so yeah absolutely uh i mean i'm i'm i am somebody who is who's more of an enterprise guy than a consumer electronics guy um it is the consumer electronics show but there's there's a lot that's really quite fundamentally quite serious hardcore industry uh, right, right. And really not related to a consumer at all at least not directly um so so yeah the whole ecosystem comes in yeah so not only uh, industrial but enterprise and that's something that i know that transform uh 
insights you in particular mentioned uh, in our pre-event um, bit that we did. And in fact, CTA cited that I think about 40% of all of the exhibitors had some kind of enterprise slant or were really? coming uh, attending with a core enterprise slant uh, at CES 2024. So yeah, it, it's really weird. Maybe they need to change the consumer part of the CTA <laughs> and the CES because um, you know, I think um, it, it is it, there is an increasing um, industrial component and enterprise component to all of this. Absolutely, absolutely. It'll be uh, much easier when it comes comes around to accreditation. It's always a bit of a struggle to find things as I've said about consumer electronics because I spend all my time talking about enterprise. Yeah, but, uh, right, right. So yes, that was. I mean, that was the that, that was the vibe of the show. What did you think about some of the content of the show? What springs to mind, Leonard? Yeah, let's uh, well, you know, let's get into it. You know, the the takes, right, and the the highlights. Um, I think for for me, I, the biggest question that I went into with, was with generative AI in particular, right? Um, I know AI broadly, but you know, that's that's an old story. We've been talking about AI forever in consumer electronics and just in the tech um, tech industry at large, but. Generative AI is something that I've been uh, opining about, writing about uh, quite extensively in 2024, simply because I've been exposed to this stuff for a long time, especially uh, thanks to uh, the semiconductor uh, industry, which has been uh, showcasing very early on uh, Gen AI applications and you know in demos, right? And given all the excitement of last year, I thought. Okay, well, we'll start to see a um, some applications start to surface, and I, I spent some time in Eureka Park. That's where I expected to see a lot of these new um, "quote unquote" innovations, and it, it ended up being a bit light. Yeah. In fact, I thought last year there was more with folks connecting, you know, these robots. Um, you know, uh, call them manic animated mannequins to yeah. Chat GPT, and I think that that was one of the things that really, really, really surprised me. And there was also little coming out from the bigger folks who are actually touting um, the the revolutionary nature of generative AI. So that that was like one of the key, one of many key uh, takeaways from CES for me. But what about you? Yeah, I mean, well, likewise, I didn't, I didn't see a lot of generative AI. Um, I, I wasn't particularly surprised by that, though. Yeah. Um, well, I, I guess to some extent, um, in, in terms of the, in terms of what generative AI can be deployed to do. Uh, I mean, it's great as a user interface enhancement. So yes, it, I'd expect it to be you know deployed in association, I guess, with many consumer devices from an enterprise perspective. Though it, it's, it's its applicability is limited uh, and it can support yeah. call centers um, and various you know help desk internal help desk uh, capabilities and it's great at doing things like sentiment analysis of calls and getting a much more comprehensive record of calls and it's not subjective um, to, to what the customer service agent thinks and how they record the call but 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 fundamentally, all of these things are incremental rather than transformational. They're about taking something that's been done before and doing it in a better and more efficient way, rather than doing something that's really quite different. Um, so so I'm not surprised that people have, have, have necessarily you know drawn a bit and thinking right. thinking about how to bake generative AI into you know day to day operations, which essentially would go unnoticed anyway, um, or or into or unnoticed by end users, or or, or into smart devices. I think the development cycles on those are, are, are reasonably long. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and definitely, you know what, I, I just want to interject here really quickly. The enterprise requirements are going to be definitely different from, mm. in many ways, than some of the opportunities that you might see on the consumer side. Like, for instance, in the use of M NPCs or non-player uh, characters or in the creation of these avatars. Um, 
uh, that, you know, I, I saw some limited stuff there. Obviously, there can be huge uh, potential in the gaming industry uh, okay. in making games more dynamic. But, you know, you it's going to be an incremental thing because we actually, gaming companies already do a lot of stuff pretty well. So we'll see in this year whether or not there's going to be some uh, interesting consumer applications that emerge but i mean a lot of these are the things that kind of make sense but to your point are going to be incremental because we do npcs pretty well we do dynamic environments fairly well this is just going to add an incremental uh, capability that will just take let's say things from the 80 percent good that we have today to maybe 85 percent right yeah, I think, uh, and 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 just just continuing the topic of generative AI, pro- probably the major way or the most uh, most high, pro- high profile way in which uh, consumers are going to be interfacing with generative AI in the immediate future is in auto, um, and 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 auto reconfigured. I think, um, you know, if, for, for this show, many of the many of the big OEMs simply weren't there. Uh, probably the main feature, or the main um, the, the 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 main thing I noticed on the automotive side was uh, Qualcomm's software vehicle platform. Um, yeah. But the you know the likes of the BMWs and the Mercedes just weren't there, other than as uh, demo demo vehicles as part of an exhibit on on some more some of the you know, interesting market entrants, people with niche propositions they were trying to demonstrate, rather than the actual big OEMs themselves. Yeah, and I, I I think there's been well the whole automotive scene I, I think has changed and uh, as we've many you know I think many of us have heard CES has turned in or the, at least a lot of folks are saying that CES has turned into an automotive show right I mean that was like sort of the big talking uh, point or tagline for quite some. Time and I think it was even espoused by the CTA to a certain degree. But I, the automotive section, which typically is hosted in the West Hall, has kind of overflowed into other areas, most notably in the North Hall, which is typically the I, IoT area, uh, where you see smart cities and and, and all other related um, non-consumer IoT. Uh, exhibitors show up, but it, it, it it's changed quite significantly. Where where um, we're seeing a transition from the the automotive automobiles themselves and this vision of what the auto uh, automobile can be or the car can be toward SDV, right? The software defined vehicle and a lot of exec- exhibitors who are offering uh, software solutions or certain specific components uh, coming in and, um, you know, uh, now showcasing that and maybe uh, in the hopes of selling through and helping to push along this advancement of the automotive architecture more toward a software defined architecture, which is fundamentally, even down at a hardware level, a huge transformation and re-architecting of the vehicle. Absolutely. Um, so a software defined vehicle is a, as, 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 as you've mentioned, I think in the past, uh, you know, the, the, the ultimate incarnation of edge, um, so. Oh yeah, <laughs> it is, and you know, uh, it, it, it's it's it, it's amazing how much uh, the uh, sensor technology has advanced, and we've seen, uh, you know, you you and I we've talked about uh, the algorithm, right? It's like, what happened to the algorithm? Why are we all talking about AI X Y Z? The algorithm and the ability to run um, just really powerful. Uh, intelligence on these edge devices is is something that you can really see making significant traction, especially uh, on the floor of Eureka Park, where you see a lot of the sensor fusion happening on specific devices to create new, let's say, vision capabilities, right? So imagine taking, um, you know, uh, video footage and then augmenting it with infrared and augmenting it with uh, you know lidar and then coming up with a new function that wasn't possible before on a single device right but then at the at a, the level of an automobile being able to fuse all that together is pretty incredible right 
absolutely absolutely i think that that is the more interesting and imp or, or an example of the more interesting and impactful context that uh, ai is going to find itself in i think that's that kind of thing uh, right powered by ai um if we can call it ai because because i figure once you've understood what ai is it's just an algorithm but if we can stick yeah. with the word with the, the term ai that's where it's going to be most impactful right think, rather than generative ai which yeah. is convenience for an end user and yeah, incremental yeah. efficiency for sure. a uh, right. enterprise. Right. And then speaking of AI, um, another big take, I think you'll agree with me on this, is that um, there was a big question mark about what people meant by AI. You know, I think it's just become an incredibly overloaded term, uh, you know, on the order of IoT. <laughs> but, um, you know, that's the other thing. And I think it's a caution out there to folks who are listening in is like, let, let's get a handle on what we're talking about. Let's not just generally talk about AI, but be specific, because that's what's going to uh, move the ball. And it's, it, you know, very notable that just generically talking about hey i'm ai this it's like you're really distracting from the core value of what your products provide and i thought that was a real disservice that people were doing to themselves yeah. at the conference especially as it relates to general vibe. but hey jim I, I you know you're there i for enterprise yes. AI, as we mentioned before and l let, let's put it a focus for a moment on what you observed on that front. Uh, I know that you guys had some really non-technical <laughs> yeah. uh, takes coming out of CES 2024, but maybe if you can share with our audience. So, so yes, I think the the, the significant majority of the uh, the meetings that we had with people mentioned uh, me mentioned some perspective on uh, on geopol geopolitics and the and 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 the frictions that might uh, that might be coming down the line, um, particularly in the, um, the 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 component IoT space and particularly in the module space. I mean, the, the, there are concerns. I mean, the, 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 there is a move within within the US to. Uh, but potentially move to a you know, more protectionist view and potentially lock out some of the Chinese vendors from the US market. Um, and there are different perspectives on whether that's necessary or not necessary. And I'm not an expert. I can't take a view on whether it is or isn't necessary. What I can do um, is say that there is a significant amount of fear, uncertainty and doubt. Um, and and that, that, that will be driving um, actions. And I'm, I'm sure, and the evidence that I saw, it was driving the thing Thinking of many people, um, particularly in the IoT module space, particularly looking to to to, to source things uh, or to focus on 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 providers that that well cut out China, frankly. Well, you know, I, I think it's really odd that you say that you're not an expert and you can't speak to this because you clearly can. I mean, you're you're talking to vendors who are are reacting to the geopolitical environment and the implications on their business, mm. right? So, I mean, yeah. I think oh, I, I, you I made a very clear much, statement here, I you can, know? I can very much talk about the impact to, do, to, <laughs> to uh, business dynamics. What, what right. I couldn't say is whether the fundamental security concerns are valid or not and whether oh, they okay. can be counted or not. Good, good, uh, good clarification. Yeah. Sure, sure. So, I mean, but, but, but it doesn't matter. Fear, yeah. uncertainty, and doubt is in yeah. the air, and, yeah. and that's what's driving people's decisions and people's yeah. thinking at this point in time. Well, you know, that's interesting, um, and it comes off of the tail coats of the 2023 CES or CES 20, uh, you know, 2023, where the Chinese vendors were generally pretty absent, right? And, uh, and for a lot of reasons, one of it was, you know, they, they were uh, dealing with, um, you know, some challenges with the, the pandemic or COVID. Um, but this year, there was a notable return of yeah. many of the the chinese vendors and uh, you know uh, against the backdrop of some you know uh, uh, you know geopolitically charged headlines such as the biden administration you know contemplating restricting uh quick uh, quick tell right and other yeah. chinese iot vendors and so now the the semiconductor concerns and are seem to be in like floating up the chain right now up into modules and then obviously with connectivity because of uh you know the um uh 
the U.S. Uh, rip and replace uh, of uh, Chinese equipment, you know, something that you uh, you folks in the uh, U.K. have as well. Um, so it seems like an expansion of uh, the concern and obviously uh, an expansion of the concern within the IoT uh, uh, community. Yes. Yeah. Abso- absolutely. And um, and 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 I even had one conversation, and 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 it was a reasonably serious conversation about how far that could extend. Uh, if you potentially want to look at the you know the estate of devices that have already been deployed, maybe connected, maybe not. And if you if you uh, want to if you want to look at those old nodes and old technology nodes, and and you really want to take out everything that's Chinese, well, you kind of got to stop the economy and. <laughs> redo everything is a yeah. enormous job um but that's an uh, point that came up surprisingly frequently i expected it to come up but i didn't expect it to come up as much as it did on the flip side actually uh in terms of making things easier and less fragmented um but particularly from an enterprise perspective there were quite a number of players who who who, who, who were trying to develop something with, with propositions were much more vendor focused so i think particularly in the world of yeah coming from world of enterprise IoT things that have been pitched at enterprise IoT developers um, in terms of software development, application development, platforms, um, connectivity, platforms managing connectivity. It's all it's all started off as something that's big, and the, and and chunks have been lopped off it um, to to descope uh, to descope solutions to be suitable for IoT, which which kind of leaves a rump which is uh, not not optimal. Um, that's not necessarily optimal, not not what you would have got to if you started from zero and you were building something ground up. Um, and I heard several stories from a number of players to the likes of Once and Flow Live and IoT Hink. I'm not sure if it's IoT Hink or IO Think, um, but uh, there, we, there we go. Um, a platform now acquired by Wireless Logic. There's a whole number of players who, who are coming up with more developer centric propositions, seeking to simplify uh, the world of iot and connectivity and 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 connected solutions and make them so that they're things that you know, can be configured by developers and deployed relatively easily um but with a ground up mentality mm. interesting so is, does that run counter to some of the things that i observed with like let's say blues and uh tell it centrion uh um how do you pronounce their last name centurion yeah centurion thank you <laughs> They're going to kill me, by the way. You realize, <laughs> um, uh, you know, who are who are really gravitating more toward, uh, you know, packaging and providing more of that, um, you know, let's say, blueprint solution br- blueprint, but also the complementary uh, technical support services to work with, like, say, closer to the end user or with a you know, a, a channel partner to take a portfolio of technologies and maybe even some connectivity and then creating a, an easy button in that fashion, right? And things that are a little bit more, let's say, vertical oriented, right? Uh, so that there's less of a guessing game and there's more of a blueprint that folks can have, you know, enough dials and knobs to turn to make things bespoke for their particular situation but largely simplifying the integration challenges right yeah, yeah exactly exactly so um so so certainly i i, I spoke with both of those companies as well mm-hmm. um and uh certainly that you know, again seeking to make it easier looking to better engage that ecosystem looking to make it easier for that ecosystem yeah. um so but 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 with a bottom-up philosophy rather than a we'll mm. start with consumer you know con- consumer data transmission from a cellular uh, network perspective and, and then taking oh. out the things you don't need it's about building the minimum um that that, right. that that you do need to support iot and ending up with something that's um more, more efficient and right. and 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 the developer can uh, effectively, you know, call off connectivity and build it into their application rather than really needing to, you know. Yeah, engineer the whole thing and then build it themselves, right? Yeah. yeah okay. All right. 
Now, um, one of the things that I think we jointly were very curious about is, uh, you know, in previous years, Metaverse was like a big deal. And, and we kind of made it a commitment going in that we're going to figure out what happened with Metaverse. And uh, so this, what was your post-mortem? Or did you guys even spend time looking at, uh, you know, XR or what, what, and, you know, all the different bits and pieces that are kind of dumped into this metaverse bucket or uh, we, we, we didn't come across much of that it did it didn't didn't feature in the the the, the meetings that we had with you know yeah. the, with, with the companies we saw when we were there um i think um i i think that the important thing to note with metaverse is that xr or ar slash vr has has been around for some time um, there are some really very impactful enterprise applications, such as you know field engineers getting very easy access to third level technical support, etc. And something like a PTC Vuforia. There's some some really quite compelling propositions. Right. right. Um, so 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 it's a great thing. Um, it can be very impactful. Um, I think that metaverse was just a word that that that, that caught the zeitgeist um and it shut up and it's come down again and i think that xr is continuing pretty much as it was before actually i think that's probably probably a good thing i think it's better to have enterprise um xr dr development driven by enterprise needs rather than having the marketing guys thinking they need to have something that they need to engage consumers because i think what that does is it messes up the development of the standards and the frameworks and the protocols you need to drive enterprise xr um but i'm sure you you you, you, you i know you've got your thoughts on uh, on on xr just a few. Um, well, I did. I, I did think it was interesting that S S Siemens came in and uh, really, you know, walked in with the banner of industrial metaverse, which you know I think was squarely decapitated last year when Microsoft and others decided that they're going to uh, you know get rid of that branding. But uh, um, you know, a, a lot of stuff that's not new. Uh, to your point, Jim, I mean, companies like PTC in particular, who are very pioneering in the application of various XR related technologies across, uh, you know, a number of industrial use cases. I mean, they've been they've been showcasing these possibilities for quite some time and the traction has been um, challenging and you know it's something that i've been uh, saying uh, for quite some time i'm almost uh, forever is a it, it's not a device problem it's a content problem it's very difficult to to produce the content but on the consumer side you know, um, there has been a bit of a revival, I, and I don't think it really has much to do with Metaverse. It's not really supporting Metaverse, but this 800-pound gorilla in the room was the brand that wasn't present and is famously not present at CES, which is Apple. Surprisingly, there was a lot of mentions of Vision Pro at, at the event, and uh, curiously, curiously, uh, a lot of the component vendors were talking about how many of the OEMs were looking for um, solutions that can up up game their offerings in their next iteration to compete with Vision Pro. But generally, I mean, generally, what I saw on the floor, uh, it, it, I think the XR community is still going in the wrong direction. There's a heavy focus on VR and gaming when we're, I think we're going to be looking at something entirely different next year in terms of focus, which is more of immersive reality and being able to capture our reality and being able to transport that reality uh, through a, bit, a digital media um, and, uh, you know, um, I think that uh, that could very well be that transition that we see this year and, and um, reflected in a very hasty uh, effort to catch up in uh, 2025 and uh, CES 2025. Yeah, and, and, and you alluded to, to it there, Leonard, but, but, it, but it's worth drawing the distinction between, we, we say XR, yeah. containing AR and VR, they're very different things and they have very different applications and different uses. Um, from an enterprise perspective, um, VR is fine for, for training, pretty much. 
um, and for some design situations where you're doing product developments, where everyone can right. view the same the the the, the same the, the 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 same view of a new product, but but AR is a fundamentally more useful thing. Um, certainly in an enterprise context. And, and, and to be honest, I suspect that it's going to be more widely adopted in a consumer context as well. Right. So, and um, and even beyond that, that, like what, it, yeah, even beyond that, it's, it's the nature of the content. And so there's re, uh, AR, but then there's also immersive reality in, in being able to capture our, surroundings and call it spatial computing uh, one aspect of it the input part is going to be that immersive reality and then the interface part the outbound part is going to be that spatial computing that allows you to engage with uh you know a an, an immersive reality media of some kind right um and, and, and that's the pivot that still has to be made, but some people are starting to see that as being an important pivot. And it was good to see, I, I mean, it's being recognized. You know, Qualcomm, they quickly came out with XR, you know, 2 Plus, okay, Gen 2, just four months after they introduced the XR2 Gen 2, right? And so, what that does is now brings new capabilities, especially in terms of you know um, uh, you know visual support of uh, taking um, you know uh, uh, providing of I think it's like 4.3p uh, resolution in each eye, which you need in order to uh, deliver anything remotely close to what the Vision Pro is going to deliver. And so there there is there are these reactions that are happening, and I think. Um, because I don't really think you need 4.3 P for gaming. Some of the games are already good enough. It's just, they're not sticky. No one cares about them, you know, at least long enough to keep these things on for more than 15 minutes. Um, the other thing that I thought was really interesting key take was micro led, um, which took on a really physical presence in LG signature, um, OLED T, television that they announced, which implements micro LED technologies. And that has implications on uh, on the XR world or this metaverse examination that we did because it's actually a critical technology that will allow um, devices to get smaller and smaller and uh, with higher resolution um, and brightness, actually, uh, which is important to, to move the category. So anyways, that, that's the synopsis of uh, uh, my, uh, at least uh, my aspect of our, uh, our metaverse post-mortem. I still think it's dead. <laughs> <laughs> I, the, the, the term may be. The concepts that existed before it will continue to exist after it. Always it's a really useful tool, yeah. but it's, yeah. it, it, it's not... It's all about spatial really computing. A technical wave. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, what what else came up? So uh, I came. I, I quite a few conversations that I had. Uh, the topic of uh, non-terrestrial networks, i.e., the convergence oh, yeah. between cellular and satellite, came up. Um, you know, so that's going to be um, there, there is going to be convergence as part of the you know three GPP standards for you know air interfaces to space and uh, yeah. converge chipsets and so on. And, and and the topic came up several times, but then the people I was talking to quite quite quickly moved on to to other topics. Uh, it was like yeah. there, there was a there was a concept there. The concept was out there. People were well aware of it. They knew it was going to be kind of important and impactful, but they hadn't really figured out what the concept was going to be. Um, so there's no detailed follow-on discussion, which is interesting. I expect that people will have formed their views a little more, or I hope so, uh, by by this yeah. by yes, twenty twenty five. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, 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 the only time I, saw, I heard it mentioned was in the CTA techno, you know, like the technical research briefing, okay. where they brought it up in um, in association with inclusiveness. So this idea that, you know, all of a sudden everyone's going to, you know, the, the rest of the unconnected will be connected type of thing. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, CES is such a visual event, right? I yeah. mean, we're attracted to visual things, not things that are transmitted over the airwaves. So we'll probably hear a lot more about it at MWC. <laughs> yes. Coming yeah, up, I expect, right? I yeah. 
Where um, you know that that's all about stuff that goes over the the airwaves and is completely. Yes, having having yeah, said that, you know, I was in quite a few meetings where people did mention it, and they didn't they didn't then follow their mention with, and we are going to do X Y Z with it. Yeah. You know, it, it was like mentioning it and moving on. So so yeah. I, I I hope the thinking moves forward quickly. It should do. There is a significant advantage opportunity there. I think for 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 that conversion. Yeah, yeah. No, I, and what about you know one of the things I noticed about. Um, the consumer IoT on the consumer IoT side of things was how things have become uh, so much more ambient. Like I went to the Amazon booth and room that they had at the Venetian. I, I walked in literally going, "So what are you guys showing?" You know, last year they had all these things running around robots and dog, you know, robotic dogs and little serving robots running around and it was packed this year a lot lighter but then also you walk in and it's like i don't see anything i see a living room i see a kitchen i see a car in the middle yeah. what are you guys showing you know yeah. and it's it seems like iot which i know that they they focus on quite a bit has somehow just disappeared yeah, it's right. it's it's, it's so. no longer well, hey we've got a connected device. It's it's baked into things, as you said. Yeah. The, the the word ambient. I, I would use the word ambient. I'll come back to it though. Why I I, tend, I try to avoid that word, but no. um, but it, it, it's just becoming part of life. It, it it is an experience. It's a it's a room in which multiple things are connected and potentially they work together and 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 in concert. It's no longer about way well, we've connected a light bulb. It it, it it's a it's a story yeah. and an experience. Yeah. Um, yeah. on, on the topic of ambient IoT, see, ambient IoT is technically um, a, a, a formally a, a standard. It is something that 3GPP is working on, um, and they um, and 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 it could potentially be quite impactful. Um, so, Williot is one of the um, leading companies in that space, and they they reckon they shipped uh, 100 million uh, ambient IoT tags right. last year, which is which is pretty considerable numbers. So, oh. so, so broadly speaking, you know, as a technology, it's it's roughly equivalent to to RFID in terms of form factor, works in a slightly yeah. Yeah. different way by energy harvesting, and and you know, there's some level of intelligence just to send out a message rather than simple backscattering. Um, and 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 you know, frankly, that is the kind of technology which really is going to make um, the IoT ambient. Um, yeah, yeah. And they they started talking about that last year. I know that I uh, went to mm. several booths, um, Ericsson, and Huawei, that showcased some uh, of exactly what you're talking about. But it's interesting to now see that make it into what is generally a consumer uh, tech event. Um, yeah. But you know, uh, and so, you know, like what I mean by uh, ambient is that in form, what we talk about in terms of like IoT, it's basically, you know, diffused itself into, like yes. you said, the products, but yeah. it in form, but maybe not in function, right? It's still really difficult to get all of these different things talking together so that it transcends the form and you actually have, and, yes. you know, and it, a seamless uh, of uh, function that you don't have to think about how it works. It just all kind of works together. We're not there yet, but you know, as far as the eyes go, you can't see it. Yes. Yeah, ab absolutely. And, and um, you know, Mat matter is doing a you know, reasonably good job of pulling together ecosystems on the consumer side. But, but if you want, you know, really yeah. tight integration between different devices, um, and and you know, leading edge integration, then you're probably better off still sticking with a with a manufacturing right. ecosystem. It's broadly the same on the enterprise side as well. Um, so so many of these vendors and solutions which have connectivity pre-integrated or, or you know, a standalone solution for yeah. monitoring something or other or a fleet yeah. solution or whatever. Um, you know, from an enterprise perspective, there is a risk if you if you go down that road of, of, of basically deploying a fragmented environment, it's a fragmented environment of iot solutions um so yeah. there's a parallel dynamic there on the enterprise and the consumer side um just to be a little careful of yeah yeah definitely and uh um uh, so 
I agree with you. And in many ways, matter has not mattered as much as we would have hoped. And integration is still always a big problem, regardless of standards. Right? Yeah, but, 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 but I suspect that uh, matter will be kind of a creeping, uh, a, a creeping de facto standardization. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So it'll, it'll continually be enhanced. And over time, the integration will get better and better. Still, to get the leading edge stuff, you might need to yeah. go to a manufacturer ecosystem. But that leading edge right. stuff is going to get more esoteric and bizarre and less and then and, 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 uh, and, and, and we'll be in the short term limited until like you said the the matter becomes more pervasive and uh, yeah. of a standard but um yeah one one you know thing that I, I that i was really interested in observing because it was such a big talking point amongst the semiconductor companies for the consumer businesses was the AIPC, right? Um, we, everybody probably had, has heard of Intel and their core ultra offering that they announced in December 14th of last year. Well, we got to see some of the laptops and, uh, you know, other devices that are going to be uh, core, based on Core Ultra, but then also offering some others like AMD and, you know, uh, you know, obviously the, the uh, up and coming X series from uh, Qualcomm. Um, but you know, here's a here's the interesting thing, and a lot of the conversations that were had around AIPC, uh, not only with the the uh, semiconductor companies, but the, the customers, there's still a big question mark about okay, uh, AIPC, but why and what is it going to really do? It's still it's still a big question for the industry and. You know, my view is that it, it still just boils down to, hey, we have AI workloads that we've been doing on PCs for a long time, and maybe some new ones that that are coming down the pipe, maybe, you know, on device, large language models, like everyone's demonstrating. But um, it's all about being able to do that stuff more um, with a, a more power efficient silicon, right? and handling those types of workloads. And then, you know, it kind of boils down to, hey, we added an MPU to our SOC or uh, to our process or, you know, our, our device and process or architecture. I don't know. Did you get, did you bump into any of that stuff or did you not care because you're so fixated on enterprise? Yeah, that's kind of, kind of a different do do domain for me, but it does seem like a bit of an incremental thing rather than a, uh, a re really transformational concept. Right. Although, you know what, Jim, I would encourage you to keep an eye on out on it because you know what, um, when I do talk to some, uh, you know, folks at Intel and, um, and Qualcomm, those two companies in particular, they're really looking to bring, bring some of that, you know, uh, efficient, uh, AI processing, uh, mm -hmm. to the edge. Right. And so it could play a factor in some of these new IoT-ish kind of solution architecturing and designing that happens out there. So something to keep an eye out on. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. As soon as you put it in an Asian environment and you start uh, you, you, you start deploying AI at the edge and re redacting uh, the information that you're sending to the cloud and obviously generating, you know, benefiting from quick response times, then, you know, it, 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 it's, it's great. This is, um, th 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 this is important stuff. Um, uh, there's a whole series of challenges around uh, deploying AI at the edge though, um, particularly around, um, um, you know, when you have self-learning AI, um, the learning experience of different nodes will be different. Um, so how you manage that as an estate and you port learnings from one place to another place and, and translate them. Um, so if you've got a, if you're monitoring a wind turbine in uh, in Denmark and you come to some AI enabled solution of, of you know, gearbox yeah. behavior that's signaling something going wrong, how would you then port that to the same thing deployed in Dubai? You know, right. You know, um, you, you're bringing up a, and because you know this gets brought up on, in uh, discussions around AI for the network, the five G network, let's say, mm -hmm. for instance, right? Uh, that these models have to be specific uh, <laughs> at the end of the day, or they are relegated to being just general, you know, and and that 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 is that fine balance that has to be had but the thing is is the economics of all of this does not lend toward one uh, it, it doesn't solve that 
decision that has to be made. Do we go, you know, low cost general, or do we spend a lot of money to make these models very specific to a particular uh, node in the network or a particular device or environment? Um, and um, that, that actually doesn't get talked about very much, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, everyone just kind of assumes that these, at the edge, these A edge AI agents, if you want to call it that, are, are, are going to be um, very specific and somehow do magic, right? Yes. That's not the case. No, no AI, AI is very much regarded as a black box, which will deliver to you the answer that you want. And, uh, and it's quite a long way from that, I think. Um, but, and, uh, but there's a way to go yet, I think, because yeah. people feel like in that problem. And you know what? I can't think of a better way to end our uh, recap here than on that note, because that's such an important note for the industry to contemplate. It's not a new notion, but it's just something that it seems like everybody has to be reminded of. And if you don't know about it, it's about time you start focusing or factoring it into how you think about um, AI in particular, which has been such a dominant theme in mm -hmm. 2023 and in all likelihood in 2024. Uh, but with that, hey, Jim, uh, absolute pleasure as always i really enjoyed spending time with you and brad in uh las vegas i know that yep. we didn't get to spend a lot of time together because we were so busy with our own you know and you know aspects of our research agenda um but absolute pleasure yeah it was good to see you there too and 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 i'm looking forward to well i was going to say i'm looking forward to ces 2025 but uh more than likely we're going to catch up in barcelona for oh, mobile world congress for yeah more fun and festivities at a hundred thousand person plus conference <sighs> yeah um and it, it, it's so difficult to distill all the stuff that we see into you know the the hour-ish or so that we have on, on these podcasts but uh you know what um everyone thank you for tuning in we really appreciate your viewership and uh, we also would appreciate your support by just liking sharing and subscribing to our respective channels uh and uh you know make sure to follow jim morish uh and follow Transforma Insights at www.transformainsights.com. And also, pr please uh, subscribe to the Next Curve YouTube channel. The easiest thing to do is subscribe to our research portal at www.next-curve.com. We have this really cool media center that basically has links to all of our massively, you know, and fast growing library of media content. And it's also a great one stop shop for all next curve research and uh, you'll also be notified uh, when we publish new articles and content such as this podcast and uh, we will see you at CES 2025 next year but more immediately as you said Jim we will see you in Barcelona for MWC 2024 take care Jim thanks everyone take care